Hello and welcome to the Insider at Home. Our inaugural magazine, The Insider, aired right after the opening stage in Doha. And as we now respect the stay-at-home guidelines to keep everybody safe in this global crisis, we bring you The Insider at Home. You can expect informal conversations with the best writers and team managers, their team owners and trainers, the best in the world of show jumping. You'll also be able to access their personal insights, their strategies and their tips. And we will also take you back, back in time to some of the extraordinary highlights in their careers and to those special moments. As always on Global Champions, we will bring you the best in show jumping. So stay tuned for weekly updates on our social media channels. My first guest is one of only seven people on this planet who won two launching Global Champions Tour Grand Prix in the same season, but with different horses. Though only 32 years young, he is about to retire a stallion. He developed himself and took through all the ranks. Six years ago, they won their first launching Global Champions Tour Grand Prix. And last season, that stallion's offspring already won two launching Global Champions Tour Grand Prix. Their names come in one breath, Verdi TN and Michael van der Vleuten. If it weren't for my second guest, I wouldn't have had a first guest. He is considered as one of the finest horsemen of the Netherlands, and he always speaks quietly. But when he speaks, people listen. He successfully combines the role of GCL team manager and team player, turning Madrid in motion into a two-time GCL Super Cup finalist and leading the team to win the first ever Super Cup in Prague in 2018. It is, of course, Eric van der Vleuten. Gentlemen, welcome to you both. And Eric, if you, if you hear your son's accolades, um, you must be quite a proud father. Of course, I'm proud about that. Um, I have uh, always worked with him together. Uh, we brought, we, uh, yeah, we built it up together everything, the horses. Um, and if you can do that in the, in the same family, the sport, what you like to do, and uh, to do it with your own son, and even the horses, what you develop yourself, then it's, uh, it's the nicest way to do, I think. Your father and son, but are you based at, at the same venue, at the same location, or are you working in separate stables? No, we are all working here um, uh, with a family on, on, on the same stable, on the same place. Uh, so the, the nicest thing uh, about um, our yard is that, 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 you know, everybody has his own stable to take care of. Uh, so our horses are standing actually separate. But I mean, we are working on the same place, uh, working in the same outdoor uh, and we can help each other every day. So um, I think it's, it's, it's a very nice place to work every day and um, to be together as a, as a family. Um, so that means that though you have separate stables, you, you meet each other regularly on, uh, on, on the arena. Does, does that mean that you work closely together? Do you ch help each other out or do you do each do it, 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 his uh, own thing? No, I think uh, my father make, uh, make every day a plan no, a working plan for his horses, um, I do for mine, I mean, um, but once we are riding, we are, we are working with the horses on the same place, so if necessary, we can, we can help each other, and, and uh, um, if I need to jump one horse, for example, um, you know, I can speak with him, and, and we, can, we can help each other a little bit. Does that mean that there's, there's no more uh, father-son uh, hierarchy, but, but more um, two people collaborating and working together? Is it, is it more like that, Eric? Yeah, we're working, we working together. We're working actually as one stable. Um, if Michael is jumping as hard, I'm normally always there beside the jumps to help him. And um, he likes that if I help him. And I like to do it as well, of course. And... Uh, I think it's always good if you have somebody on the ground who can uh, look a little bit from the side uh, because it can be the, the view can be a little bit different than it feels and uh, I think on this moment the professional sport what we do you see also the top riders they have always somebody behind uh, or beside it who always can uh, can give some advice so often that also means that very likely you, you know each other's strengths and, uh, and, and weaknesses. Michael, what is the biggest strength of your father? What, what does he bring the most? What is, what is he very strong at? Um, yeah, I think in, in my case, I think that the most important is that we have, 
uh, did the same way of writing, the same way of thinking about uh, certain things, you know. Um, and I think we are quite always on the same line, and that that makes, uh, um, you know, the relation uh, a bit easier. I think. Uh, I don't think we need many. We don't need many words to to under uh, understand each other. Eric, I have to ask you the same question, of course. What, what's what's Michael's um, biggest strength? What makes him such a good writer at the moment? I think his fanatism. He's always very fanatic. He is a hard worker. Uh, if we are uh, back home late on Sunday night, on Monday morning at eight o'clock, he's on his first horse again. And yeah, good makes him quite successful, I think. And always he can think also good in his horses. Um, he feels good what his horse needs. Uh, how his horse uh, likes to go uh, in the best way the horse wants to go. And uh, I think he's, he's good in that, yeah. Um, talking about those horses, we're in extraordinary times, as, as we've mentioned already. Um, what are your top horses doing at the moment? What are they up to? Yeah, now at the moment we are, uh, of course, it's a little bit different. Um, uh, in this situation, okay, the, our, our, uh, all the horses, uh, we try to keep them in shape. Uh, we ride them, but like I said, we are luckily, we have a quite big place with different arenas. Uh, we have a gallop track, we can go, uh, we can ride two meters far in the, in the forest. So we try to do uh, a little bit uh, variation with the horses that they don't have to do all the time the same, but they stay mentally also good in the mind. Um, I think that's very important for the, for the, for the all the horses. Uh, on the other hand, these are also actually not such a bad times that we can spend a little bit more time on the one horses. We normally, okay, because we are quite often to the globals, to the big shows, uh, and quite many weeks in that. So, but now we have a little bit more time uh, to uh, to spend the time on, on on the young horses to make them more developing and uh, bring them up uh, a little bit more, you know, at home. Uh, be building every week a different course, some different gymnastics. So uh, for that, it's a, it's a good time to spend uh, uh, time in that. Talk about those gymnastics. You're going to give us a few tips and tricks and show us you, some of those exercises that you at the, the Van der Vleuten's table that you use. Uh, you spoke about um, the older horses, and one of those horses is, of course, the great Verdi. Um, he is 18 years old at the moment. He's about to retire. Uh, Michael, where is he? What's Verdi doing at the moment? Um, uh, yeah, so, so with, um, with the other owners, um, we decided to, to bring him to the family Nyhoff. Um, I think he can, uh, he can enjoy his retirement there. Um, they will move him a little bit under the saddle. Um, uh, you know, he can go a little bit on the field. And um, okay, he's based on the on the place where he does the the, the breeding. So so that makes life a bit easier for him and the whole organization around his breeding. All right. Uh, how did you meet Freddy? How did he come onto your path? How did he cross your path? Um, yeah, so so actually they, they, they asked me to, to just then come and have a sit on him. Then he was actually standing on the place where where we brought him uh, two weeks ago. Uh, I think he came four years old and, and, and that was actually the first time uh, I made a few little jumps with him. And was it, uh, for you, was it straight away a, a direct hit? Was there straight away a connection? Could you feel that he was special? Uh, yes, I think so. He, um, I felt myself straight away very comfortable, which is very nice, you know, for the rider to, to feel comfortable on a horse. Uh, okay, he felt very scopy. Um, it looked like he had a very good mind. But okay, then they, then they become four years old and they have the whole future in, in, in front of him. But um, for me, it's always very important when, when, you, when you sit on a horse for the first time, um, you get already kind of a feeling with, with a horse, with every horse actually. And I don't need many jumps to, to feel some positive things and some things I like to feel on a horse. 
and I think uh, Verdi had um, you know quite a lot of a lot of things where where I was happy with. Well, I promised to take you back in time. I'm going to take you back in time. Nine years to be precise. It is the year 2011. It is Valencia in Spain. It is um, Verdi's first ever launching global champions tour um, Grand Prix. We still have got the video of, uh, of Verdi TN um, out there in Valencia in, uh, in that uh, Grand Prix. We see him here as, um, as a nine-year-old. It was his first launching global champions tour Grand Prix, but how he jumps how he goes, how he be behaves, uh, the connection, his, his his composition as well. Um, it looks like it didn't change between 2011 and how we last saw him in 2019. Uh, was he always very mature, uh, Eric Michael? Yeah, okay. In the, in the beginning it was all new and, and um, uh, for him, of course, and also for us as a combination. But I think uh, through the years, just just you know, try to develop the right ability. Um, uh, he could be a bit, you know, a bit spoiled, a bit happy, and, and, and that didn't make the right ability always that easy. But I think um, because he had such a good mind, and he all, also always wanted to develop himself. And I think, you know, through the years, I think we got better combination every year, you know, and. Um, uh, yeah, so during the years, I think um, you also could see some developments in, in, you know, in his power, in his right ability, and also in the jump offs he made, you know, in, in the, because the first few years it was always quite hard, you know, to get inside the time, but on the end, we even, you know, could have some good results and be in the top three of some, some many Grand Prix. So, yeah, I think we developed the right way through the years. Yeah, well, we, we see the, the emotion uh, right there. That was the, um, the round before the jump off that you went clear. In the end, it is first ever launching Global Champions Tour Grand Prix. Um, you guys would end third uh, straight away onto the podium. Later that year, 2011, um, you would go on to compete at the European Champions, uh, Championships with him, um, again in Spain, again in, uh, in Madrid at that time, um, to finish on bronze. But it seems like Spain, and especially Madrid, brings out the best of you in, uh, in Michael. This is the jump off of the 2014 Launching Global Champions Tour Grand Prix in, uh, in Madrid. And Marcus Ening and Plot Blue lead in a jump off with only two men, Ening and yourself. You're last to go. Let's have a close look. Last summer in France, he'll be in the top two. Can he beat 51.32 seconds? back to four. They're the two elements of the triple combination. It's all so full of beans, Birdie. Comes the Rioja, now the turn back. Both just going between the start finish beam and that flower pot. He is really trying for it. Come on, Michael. He comes towards the last 51.32 to beat. He's got a lot in hand. He sits up to ride the vertical. Gallops on now towards the finish beams. 49.68. Michael van der Blitten takes his first ever Longines Global Champions Tour Grand Prix here in Madrid. He's going to stand on top of the podium for the Netherlands. Beautiful images from the club Campo de Villa, the first launching global Champions Tour Grand Prix win for you, and of course that magic um, Verdi T. And is there anything special about Madrid, uh, Michael, to you? Because you um, you were successful at the Europeans, you won the Grand Prix in 2014, you were third in 2017, last year 2019 you were second, where you finished behind Martin Fuchs and Chaplin, Chaplin, who is the son <coughs> of Verdi. Is there anything particular about Madrid that you like so much? No, but one thing I know is that, um, you know, the shows in Spain, especially in Madrid, inside and outside, I think they are, you know, great shows. Uh, the facilities are super. And I think we as a rider, we, um, you know, have a good feeling if we are there at those shows. And, of course, uh, the horses need to have a good feeling as well. And if they, you know, if we both feel comfortable as a combination, we are ready for good results. Um, Eric, back to you. Um, you've 
worked with Michael and with Verdi. We saw Valencia. Michael was 22 years young. Verdi was nine. Um, you've guided them all the way through their entire career. But who were you training the most? Were you training Verdi or were you training Michael? Yeah, I think in both. Um, okay, you work as a combination, uh, horse rider combination. Um, and uh, yeah, okay, specialist. Uh, Verdi has been always a special horse for me. Um, he's ca he came here as a four year old, and uh, yeah, good. He brought all those years here, and he brought actually all, all our success uh, for our stable. And uh, I think he made also Michael uh, as a rider where he where he's now. And uh, so in that case, for me, it's uh, always been a very special house. In in Prague 2018, uh, with Madrid in motion, you won the Global Champions League Super Cup. Um, and just before the podium ceremony, I saw you, Eric, being very emotional. You had you had tears in your eyes as Michael's groom led Verdi to to a calmer spot. Your team had just won 3 million euro in prize money. And all you said, all you could say was, look at that horse. Look at how he goes. That's the horse that deserves a statue. At that moment, it got very clear that it's, it's more than just a horse. He has to be part of your family, I think. No, of course. And, uh, on that moment, it was, of course, a very special uh a very special success uh, for our team as well. It was the first uh, final of the Global Champions League. And if you can win that uh, with the team, and then uh, that also Michael with Ferdi was in the team, uh, it made it special, of course. And uh, also for our uh, owners, um, for our team owners, the horse owners, it was a, a, a nice day, a, a great success on that day. Well, we'll talk about Madrid in motion and the Global Champions League later on. Um, just to show you how influential and how important Verdi has been on the launching Global Champions Tour in this last decade, um, we've got a very interesting stat. Um, only five horses did better than Verdi in terms of, uh, of podium finishes. And it, those are just the biggest names in, uh, in, uh, in the sport. Well, if you look at, uh, at that statistic, it is Casal who uh, was 21 times on, uh, on the podium. He still is um, the most successful horse of, uh, of the launching Global Champions Tour. Ito du Chateau also way up there in second place. Don VHPZ Explosion, who is the um, only active horse at the moment. Then Hello Santos. And then um, seven times on the podium, Verdi, Glocks London and, uh, and Shutterfly. That is, um, well, that's just a list of the biggest names uh, in show jumping, the biggest equine athletes that are right there. Um, so basically, he sits there amongst the best horses in the world, the best horses that have ever competed on the Launching Global Champions Tour. And um, how does it feel now looking at that statistic and see him in that uh, in that very select group of horses? Yeah, it's nice to you know we actually never look at those um, at those numbers, but it's it's good to hear that he's in you know in in in, in this list. Um, of fantastic horses and it's not easy these days to get in any GCT um, a podium place um, between these riders and these horses, um, rider-horse combinations, you know, it's not easy these days to, to get a podium place. So I'm very proud of, you know, especially Verdi that, um, that we could do this as a, as a combination. And now he's going to be retired. You planned on doing that earlier this season in, uh, in Den Bosch, but the event got cancelled like many other events due to the corona outbreak. And are there any plans on when to retire him officially? Um, we spoke a little bit about it and um, you know, I think we're we gonna, we gonna wait for next year, Sertogen Bosch. You know, I think he's on the right place now at the moment and uh, we're gonna pick it up for next year. But I have the feeling it's going to be Seth Ogenbos again. Okay. Well, um, there is, of course, also life after Ferdi, and it has already started um, with two new launching Global Champions Tour Grand Prix winners. It's Beauville Z and, uh, and Dana Blue, especially Beauville Z. He really came onto the circuit um, uh, with, a, with a firing start, a big win in Monaco in Monte Carlo. Were you surprised, Michael, that Beauville picked up so quickly? Um, I was a little bit surprised um, when I got it as a seven-year-old. Um, you know, it, it was already a talented horse. Um, that means also, you know, the right, right ability, a good mind, um, extremely careful. 
but it's always hard to say by then how far they can get on the end. Um, I took a little bit of time with him in the beginning, so I mean the 140 classes, the 145 classes, you know, I, I, I just gave him um, the right confidence, but the moment the confidence was there, that he believed in me as a rider, then all of a sudden it went very fast and maybe a bit quicker than we all expected. But that's also the the nice thing about the sport that, you know, some horses, they you expect a lot as a very young age, but on the end, somehow they, they struggle. And in this case, I think Beauville really moved up to a five-star top horse. And I think the last year he, he had extremely good results and... He, you know, he's, he's, yeah, I can say he's, he's my best horse at the moment. Yes, and then you have got uh, Dana Blue, who supported Verdi for a very long time. She came out also fantastic in the 2019 season. Second in Madrid, winning in, uh, in Valkenswaard. And with that win, Michael, you entered another very select group of riders um, winning multiple Grand Prix in one season, but on different horses. It, it happens very, very rarely. Have a look at this, um, at this statistic. In the 2019 season, you were the only one to pull it off. Um, it was very rare. It's very unusual. 2018, actually, we had three riders who, uh, who made it happen. And Scott Brash did it in two different years. But if you look again, who's in there, there's also uh, Meredith Michaels Beerbaum, 2008. She was the very first to do it with, um, with Shutterfly and with, uh, with the great um, checkmates. Um, Eric, when I look at those three horses, you look at Verdi, you look at Beauville Z, uh, you look at, uh, at Dana Blue, those are three launching global champions, two Grand Prix winners. But when, when you look at them, they, are, they seem to be three completely different horses, aren't they? Uh, yes, they are different horses. Um, uh, Dana Blue is a horse with a lot of blood. She's very sensitive. Um, she needs also a rider who is quiet on her, you know, you can make her uh, uh, quite quickly obsessed. Uh, but she has a super quality, she has a super mentality, uh, she always likes to do the good thing and she's very competitive. She's fast in the course, she, uh, she is a natural winner, I think. Uh, Boville is uh, a horse with a nice temper, I think. Uh, a little bit easier temper uh, he has. He has, uh, he has blood, but he is, his rideability is uh, a bit more classic, a bit more classic way. Uh, but it's also a horse with, uh, with super quality, very careful, and also a very good mind. And um, one thing we, we, we've, we spoke about what, what the differences are between the horses, but one thing that many of your horses have in common is that they are owned by Marta Ortega as, as horse owner. Um, it seems that Marta Ortega has become very pivotal in, in the career of both yourself, Eric, and, uh, and in, uh, in Michael. How, how, does that, how did that partnership, that collaboration come together, Eric? Yeah, I was, I'm working already uh, since 2013 uh, with Marta. Uh, before she was riding herself, uh, I was training her. And uh, in that time, I was helping also uh, Sergio Moya. Um, and uh, I helped them together. I, in that year, I went also the, the national uh, trainer of the, of the Spanish team, of the national team from Spain. Um, so I was working already a long time with her together, um, and then on the moment that she um, uh, made a break, in her, a break in her riding, she asked me or I could start to compete her horses, um, and uh, yeah, that's how it went. So uh, finally, before I was actually half quit my rider, I, I, my riding, I didn't show anymore. Uh, but I was still riding a lot at home. I was riding also the horses, horses for Marta in that time at home. Um, so, but uh, then I start showing slowly on again. And uh, yeah, good. On the moment now, I'm uh, I'm a little bit more there on the on on, on the higher level. With, the, with our horses, uh, we're very proud to ride our horses. They're very nice horses. And uh, so slowly on it grow a little bit like that. We had always a very good connection um, with the family of Tega, with, especially with Marta. And uh, so she started also um, uh, 
helping us with, uh, with Michael, with the horses, and uh, supporting him as well in his riding and in the horses. So we are very proud that we can work with her together. And it's also very good for us because you know how difficult it is to do this level uh, with uh, this amount of horses. It's uh, normally impossible to do, but uh, with the support of, uh, of her, uh, of Martha, it's, uh, it's a, a great support. And we are very happy with that and very proud of it. Well, Marta was also Marta Teg was also very pivotal in the launch of Madrid in Motion, as she's team owner of Madrid in Motion. Um, the team has been part of Global Champions League since the very beginning in 2016, and you two, uh, Eric and Michael, you joined in 2017, but it was in 2018, in the third season, that the team really came uh, together, culminating into that big win at the GCL Super Cup in uh, in Prague. But the road to that success wasn't so easy. You came tenth in uh, the uh, regular season, so you had to start in the quarterfinals and you qualified in that quarterfinal as the fourth team to go through into the semis. You won the semifinals as the only team on a triple clear and the team led after round one of the final with Eduardo Alvarez Aznar as last to go in uh, round two. He held a margin on seven of seven faults on Valkeswaard United. And we're going to have a look at um, his final round. Even if he wasn't the last rider. Here we go then. Oh, the decider. After this. Nice pace to start with. Just got to watch that back end technique. It's a little bit traily at times. That's what caused that fault in the first Oof. class. And he was very close there. It was a this, this is feathers the, difference. This is the one. Get this one out of the way, Edu. And he has. Oh, a long way off that oxer. Give it real space. There's nothing like knowing how your horse jumps. Little rub there. Team are hopping around watching this. Yeah, he's he's pretty good on his pace. Er Eric can barely look. Eric can't look. Oh, he's a bit tight there. And he's having to do the seven. He's almost coming back the tongue. The tongue is actually out the side of his mouth. Not Edu's, but the horse. Just this last line. He's going to have time for but he who can, cares about that? He can have the time for this for the biggest prize Barry, in the sport. And he gets there, 66.52. Elation there as Madrid in motion steam in to make history. They finish on a total of 11. They beat Valkenswaard United. And Rockefeller is rock solid all the way to the finish as Madrid in motion have come from behind here. They were 10th in the championship through the season. They have jumped their way into the top. They were triple clear through the semi-finals. They've again produced the goods here. Just three one scores between the lot of them, essentially doing the same again. And that is what wins you the biggest pot ever seen in the sport of show jumping. The relief, the tension all starts to swill away from that warm-up area because now it is elation and excitement amongst the whole lot of them as Madrid in motion become crowned as the first of the Global Champions League Super Cup winners. And what a super finish, James. That was wonderful stuff, wonderful from Edward. Well, still, if you watch it even today, um, Eric and Michael, I, I, I can imagine it still gives you goosebumps, doesn't it, Michael? Yeah, of course. It, it always will stay in my in my good memories, of course. Just what my father said before, um, to win that first um, GCL final. Um, I think that's you know, who won it. Is that it's it's a win who goes in the history, and and uh, we are very proud of that moment. Especially when the whole season went maybe not as good as we planned, but we knew, of course, that we had some some. Good riders there with, with a few fantastic horses. And um, I think at that moment, uh, that week, I think we all rode very strong and we had the horses in the right shape, I think, on, on, on the good moment. Yeah. Um, Eric, you were there as a rider and team manager, but you didn't make any changes to the lineup throughout the entire weekend. Quarterfinals, semifinals, and final, you always stuck to the same riders. And, um, and the same horses, though you had the chance to change with, with so much at stake at that point. Was it a difficult decision to make? No, I don't think it was a difficult uh, decision on that moment uh, because I think we planned it very well, that final. Um, 
I must say during the season, uh, we were not that great. We were medium. We, were, we, did, we didn't have great results. But in our heart, we all knew that we could have uh, top horses and top riders in the final. And uh, we, uh, I must say, we had a great team together. And we were all focused on Prague on that moment. Uh, already a few months before, we told each other, uh, we bring our best horses uh, to the final. And we really make sure that we have them in good shape there. And I must say, we had three top riders with three championship horses. We had that year uh, Mark Houtshager with uh, um, Camillo. Um, and uh, we had uh, Eduardo, who's a fantastic uh, rider, um, with Rockefeller and uh, Michael with uh, Verdi. So that's actually three championships horses. Uh, so in our heart, we knew we could have a chance on that final and we put everything on that, uh, yeah. that season. So, uh, and it worked out well. And then it's, of course, a great feeling. I can imagine it was a great feeling for yourself. Uh, what do you think, Eric, it meant to, uh, to Marta Ortega as a team owner uh, with, with so much media at display, with so much money at stake? How did it feel for her, you think? Yeah, she was, of course, very enthusiastic and uh, she really uh, enjoyed it. And, uh, and, and that for us, she's a great support. And, and then it's also good if you can make it on the end of the season if, and even if you didn't have, we didn't have a great season during the year, but she always was behind us and, uh, and supporting us, the whole team. And, uh, and if you can make it then in such a good final uh, with such a good result, then uh, that makes it even more special, of course. Eric, can you imagine 15 years ago that, that did you ever think that you could be in such a position, um, being a team rider and leading a team to, to, to go into a show where you could win more than 3 million euro in prize money? No, that was, that's incredible. I mean, I, I remember that uh, I was riding like uh, 30 years ago uh, on, in Grand Prix for 10,000 guildens. It's like uh, 4,500 uh, euros. Um, we were riding Grand Prix and then we were di discussing or if we ever should, sh or it would ever should happen that we could, could win 100,000 guildens on one show. That was, uh, we couldn't think about that. And uh, if you see now what's going on in, uh, in the whole sport, I mean, uh, the development, uh, uh, it's amazing uh, the way it goes. Uh, I mean, it's, it's fantastic for, for, for us all. And I uh, you know it's great, great, great. Um, yeah. This Global Champions League has been, um, has been groundbreaking, has been, been a novelty in our sport. Um, you've been in the league since the beginning, since 2016, on, on two different teams. Um, Eric, do you see any change in the perception on how riders, fans, uh, even owners and managers look at the league over those last five seasons? Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's really growing. And uh, the main... The main classes uh, on the moment uh, on the shows, and uh, like you can see now that uh, that all the best horses in the world uh, going now in the team competitions. Uh, if you see like uh, Explosion and Clooney go together in a in a team competition, uh, the number uh, number one and two of the European Championships. I mean, then you speak about the best horses, uh, what uh, what they're going to use for these classes. So that means something how also the riders and the owners and also the team managers uh, think about this, uh, this formula. Uh, Michael, from your side, um, you're of course much younger than your, uh, your father. Uh, you came into the sport um, as a different uh, generation. Um, but over the last decade, let's say, since you started with Verdi, you, you got him as a four-year-old and now you, you retire him as an as a 18-year-old. There's, there's a lot of time in between. Um, also, the prize money grew. Uh, is there any different? Do you see any different in how your stable functions at the moment? I mean, um, what impact has has got that that increase of prize money on on the functioning of of your stable at home? Yeah, okay. It, um, of, of of course, it, it if you compare to many like in the beginning of my career, um, of course, if you look on the end of the year, uh, you of course the, the change in prize money is is it's a big difference. Um, and of course, that helps for, for the whole stable. But I think the, um, the, the dealing with the horses, that's something we also like to do. Um, so it's not that because of the 
the price, the more, much more price money we win, that we slow down in the in the dealing of the horses. It's something we also like to do. Um, start to find or to 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 breed like good young horses and um, horses where we see the right talented in, and with those horses, you know, start working with and um, say when they are five, six, or seven year old. Then we we speak about them and, and try to make the right decision for that horse. Sometimes, yep. you know, we try to keep them and 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 build them up for the biggest level, or um, you know, maybe it's it's the right horse for someone else, and uh, we try to sell the horse. Because with the increase of prize money, um, also the value of of a good horse has increased. Of course, because everybody knows. Um, how much my, how much prize money there is to win at those shows at the moment, but also how um, uh, how difficult the classes are uh, for how how good horse you need to be competitive at this level, and um, also the you know how many shows there are at the moment. Uh, if, if if for example for me, um, if you're quite high on the on the world ranking list and you're able to go week in, week out to these big shows, um, you can't have enough horses. And, um, and that's for everybody the uh, kind of a problem. So um, I think everybody is looking for, for, the right, for that right special horse. Uh, now, in, in, in these moments, these weeks, and, and hopefully not too long, but the moment that we're living in now with this crisis, there are no shows, so there is also no prize money. Um, without being disrespectful, what effect does it have on, on the function of your, your stable? Do you now uh, all of a sudden sense the lack of that prize money that, that is normally on offer? Uh, Eric, as, as income, as revenue? Yeah, of course, the prize money is a part of the income. Um, okay, like I said, we are also uh, very lucky and happy that we have uh, Marta as an owner uh, behind us. Um, otherwise, it's very hard. I mean, if you uh, have your own horses who are not competing and uh, there's no income, then it's, uh, yeah, you can do that for a while, but uh, that's not, a, not, not that easy then. And I think it's for, for many stables and, uh, and, and riders uh, a hard time. Yeah. Well, um, let's hope that we're, that we're out competing again, uh, again soon, that we're back onto those big grass arenas, arenas and on those uh, sand rings battling it out for, uh, for the prize money. Uh, something, something different. Um, in this period uh, of the crisis, um, the social media networks are being flooded with exercises, with tips and tricks of riders on how they train their horses, um, exercises they build at home. And we've asked you to bring us um, an exercise that you also use a lot at, uh, at home in, uh, in the Netherlands. And here we have a look at it. Um, Michael, basically, if I've got it right, it is divided into three parts. I think the first exercise is, um, is at the bottom of, uh, of the drawing. What, what can you tell us about it? Yeah, so what I wrote down, so, what, so, what we, so basically on the bottom, um, I put three poles with uh, about 30 meters in between. Um, what we try to do is, is basically some, some dress size, some flat work between poles. Um, okay, in this example, I put just three on a row. But I think on this tree you can um, do already a lot of things, change the, the, the strides between the poles. Um, so started on the first two a little bit more forward and try to collect them a little bit uh, between the, the other two. You can play, you can play a lot um, between those poles and just to get every time more and more control um, on your horse. Um, I think that's a lot of there is the focus is it's basically you know on that just to get the right control and and yeah in those 30 meters uh, what is what is standard what, what for people watching at home who might want to try this what are the standard strides in those 30 meters and if you say add one and 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 or ride one more ride one less then we understand but what is the the standard striding in in that pattern yeah, so this is a little bit actually two times a little bit uh, like a little bit three strides, a little bit in the rhythm. Um, that's how it's built now, but you can you can play a lot. You can do three, four, five strides just to. Okay, it also depends on 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 the stride of the horse, of course. 
yeah. a horse with a, with a bigger stride, it will be a bit easier, but to make an extra one will be more difficult. So um, I think you can practice a lot on these three rails already. All right. And um, then we go to the top of, uh, of your drawing. Um, there you, you've given us two loops. Uh, in the middle, there is um, a central placed oxer. Um, and if I understand it well, you can uh, approach the oxer on, um, uh, on, on, on different ways, coming in straight or on, on, the, uh, on the broken line. What's, what's the plan with that um, exercise, Michael? Um, okay, it's just, just to be, you know, you know to, get, to get focused on, 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 on the basic things uh, a lot. So, I mean, that they, that they make the turns well, that they, that they don't fall uh, into our inside leg, that they, that they go straight to the jump every time, um, uh, get them land on the, on, the, on the left and right lead, you know, as both sides uh, the same easy. Um, to stay in the horse in the right balance in between the jumps, um, you know, just to, to get them listen to the rider. And... Um, uh, it all comes to the same point just to get them nice and easy through the body and, and you know, to make them just lose and, and, and good in the body. Yeah. Eric, before you said this is an excellent exercise to teach a horse to land on the right rein. Yes, I think it's important that a horse needs to land in the, in, the, in the good lead, you know. If you go left and they should land on the left in the, in the left uh, gallop and then the other way around. Uh, it gives a good balance to the horse. And uh, yeah, I said all, already before, I, we don't make the exercises too complicated at home. We are not so uh, complicated in our training. We try to keep it easy. Um, but uh, those exercises, you know, to keep the horses loose in the body and to lengthen and shorten, I think it's important for them. All right. Um, those are some very nice exercises, I think, for the people watching um, to practice at home. Thank you very much, uh, Michael and Eric, for sharing these. We'll share these as well on our social media channels so you can try them at home. But uh, don't forget, don't bite off more than you can, uh, than you can chew. Um, Michael, Eric, thank you very much, not only for sharing um, these exercises, but for giving us some insight on um, how the stable works at home, on your insights on Verdi and, of course, on uh, Madrid in motion. Thank you very much, very much for joining us on the first edition of the Insider at Home. Great stories and great insights. Um, for the rest, you at home also, thank you very much for joining us. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram, on uh, Facebook and on all our social media channels. And stay tuned for the next episodes. And above all, stay healthy and stay safe. Thank you for watching and bye-bye.